For 150 years, Canada's vast natural resources have kept global industry humming. Canada has an incredible wealth of resources. Some people even say that we are a resource superpower. We are the engine of the planet. They've kept people on the move. Canada's the largest supplier of oil to the United States. And put food on the tables all over the world. I don't think people know how important Canada is in terms of feeding the world. We have fed billions of people worldwide. We have an inordinate impact on the rest of the world. We just don't necessarily pay attention to it. And this is about time that we did. But just how important are our contributions? As Canadians, we tend to be humble about our role in the world. But that is about to change. Over the next hour, we'll conduct a thought experiment that will examine just how devastating life would be if Canada and all its resources disappeared today. explore how its disappearance might remake the world. Without the resources that Canada has, there's only so far that humanity can go. Without us, everything grinds to a halt. We'd see mass starvation. People would die. And how our absence would plunge the planet into chaos. A world without Canada would be a violent, dark place. We would not realize how much we had lost until it was gone. And then we would be terrified. This is the world without Canada. In North America, another normal day has begun. But as millions are about to learn, this day will be anything but normal. This is the day the world without Canada is born. To begin our thought experiment, all 9.1 million square kilometers of Canada has to go. We're carving it all down to about 3,600 meters, roughly the average depth of the ocean floor. As Canada vanishes, so do two million freshwater lakes. That's more than all the other lakes in the rest of the world combined. Nine percent of the planet's trees, 17 percent of the world's coastline, and countless species of rare and endangered animals. But how would the planet respond to Canada's disappearance? The response of the planet to that sort of insult would be so dramatic. The Atlantic, Pacific and Arctic oceans now rush to fill the giant hole. The removal of the vast amount of land occupied by Canada would cause this massive bathtub effect. This would lead to so much turbulence, massive tsunamis, unlike anything we have seen, that are going to ripple out and affect whatever continents are surrounding. Those ripples are now 10 kilometer high waves that are going all around the world. The largest tsunami in human history now rolls towards what was once the US and Canadian border. Well, a giant wave doesn't give way to anything. Get in, let's go, let's go, let's go. A large tsunami can totally ravage and destroy almost any buildings in its path. One cubic meter of air weighs one kilogram. One cubic meter of water weighs a thousand kilograms. The worst tornado that you've ever seen would really pale in comparison to the destructive force of a really powerful tsunami. the planet, coastal cities would be pounded by monster waves triggered by Canada's disappearance. The impact would be so dramatic, it's almost beggars the imagination. The day of destruction has passed, but once the water's settled, what might this new world look like? The Atlantic and Pacific are now one. There would be the most bizarre seafront across the northern edge of the United States where Canada was carved out. And America now has a 6,000 kilometer coastline that's as long as the Nile River. As coastal cities like New York are swamped, 
America faces a massive cleanup operation. But there's a problem. The loss of Canada's oil fields has pitched the planet into a massive petroleum shortage. Canada's a huge producer of oil. We're an exporter to the whole world of the raw materials required to drive our industrial civilization. For over 150 years, Canada has been a major player in oil. In fact, in 1858, carriage maker James Miller Williams kick-started the entire industry when he dug the continent's first oil well in southwestern Ontario, beating the Americans to the punch by almost a year. With the help of a simple hand-cranked pump, Williams was able to pull out five barrels a day of the substance that would soon transform the entire world. Now, Canada exports about three million barrels of oil per day. So you can imagine, for instance, the impact that that would have. When it existed, Canada exported to dozens of countries. But one in particular is feeling the pinch now that we're gone. The United States, although they complain greatly about their reliance on Arab oil, they rely on Canadian oil more than anything. 43% of their oil imports are coming from Canada. So Canada has basically replaced the Middle East as the major source of oil. Using a network of pipelines that could circle the globe 20 times if laid end to end. Every day, Canada provides the United States with enough oil to fill 200 Olympic swimming pools. What happens when all of that disappears? Imagine the traffic jams. Without Canada's oil, all of a sudden you get a scarcity. Gas prices in America shoot way up. People rush to gas stations, you get ridiculous long lines, people are angry. These would be very desperate times. I'm never gonna get used to these guards. Armed security would be required around gas stations. It's now just demand, demand, demand. We need more. Oh, come on! What are you left for? People start to fight over who gets the small supply that's left. Back off! Hey. hey! More disruptions in gas supplies today, leading to tensions and violence at the gas pump. This following the sixth consecutive month of rising gas prices. It's the worst oil crisis to hit the United States since Arab oil producers turned off the taps in 1973 to protest American involvement in the region. Oil was cut off, gas prices went from $3 to $12. Everybody scrambled. People formed long lines to try and fill up with gas. The shortage caused America to look north for its gas. The world moves along. It functions without too many hitches because Canada's stable provisioning of what the world needs in a reliable, safe, and friendly way. But with Canada gone, it has to go back to the Middle East. We would see redoubling of American efforts to exert control in the Middle East. It is going to mean war, a war of conquest, a war for resources. But the absence of Canada's oil won't just be felt on the roads. Two out of every 10 barrels we produce are used in manufacturing. It would really surprise you how many things we use in our lives are made from oil. From candles to toothbrushes to plastics, everything is basically made out of oil in some shape or form. Most tires start out as seven gallons of the stuff. Fleece jackets come from oil recycled from 25 plastic water bottles. Many lipsticks are 60% oil. In fact, for almost 100 years, oil has been a key ingredient in cosmetic products. Just like the ones launched in 1914 by beauty pioneer and Woodbridge, Ontario native Florence Nightingale Graham, or as she would later be known, Elizabeth Arden. After learning the ropes of business selling vegetables in Toronto's St. Lawrence Market with her dad, Arden moved to Manhattan and in 1910 opened the first of her legendary Red Door salons. And by the 1930s, Arden's cosmetics were one of the top three most recognized brands on the planet, alongside Coca-Cola and Singer sewing machines. Today, the business empire created by that dreamer from Woodbridge is valued at well over a billion dollars, and the products have been used by such luminaries as Marlena Dietrich, Jackie O, Queen Elizabeth II, and Marilyn Monroe. But without Canadian petroleum, industries all over the globe scramble to deal with the shortfall. We are so necessary. Without us, everything grinds to a halt. As the survivors are about to find out, this is just the beginning.
To understand the vital role Canada plays in the world, we've removed it. What would we do? What kind of a world would we live in? And what are we left with? It's a really scary scenario. When it vanished, coastal cities across the globe were swamped with water. But once the water settles, what might the world without Canada look like? We would see a reduction in the worldwide ocean height. Covering the second largest country on the planet means a massive drop in global ocean levels. Where you used to have bays and inlets would all just be mud. Some of the biggest coastal cities in the world, like New York, would just be the city and then all of a sudden a big mud pit around it. And Hawaii is on top of a mountain. The world literally would be unrecognizable. But the disappearance of one particular body of water has much more dire consequences. One of the defining characteristics of Canada is the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are not called seas. And the only reason they're not called seas is that they're freshwater, not salt water. When they still existed, the five Great Lakes covered over 240,000 square kilometers of territory and accounted for roughly 20% of all fresh water on the planet. They contained enough of the world's most precious resource to completely submerge all of North and South America to a depth of almost a meter. The Great Lakes are one of the world's wonders. We are so lucky in Canada to have the security of freshwater resources that we have. But when Canada disappeared, they were contaminated by salt water and debris from the tsunami. Imagine tsunamis going over gas stations and oil fields. With that comes contamination and disease. You have dead carcasses in water. Millions of lives are now jeopardized. Every day, the Great Lakes used to supply drinking water to one in three Canadians and almost 24 million Americans. Sorry, guys, that's it. We're out of water. Come back later. On, Government attempts to make up for loss of the Great Lakes would be next to impossible. Further south, people are struggling with another consequence of Canada's disappearance. Until it vanished, Canada sat atop the North American tectonic plate. It's one of the 18 floating slabs of rock that make up the Earth's crust. Canada's a heavy country. It actually weighs a lot. It's made out of rock. If you remove it from Earth, there's a rebounding of the crust, and that would cause all kinds of gigantic earthquakes unprecedented in the history of the world. Our disappearance has sent shockwaves through the planet's crust. But just how quickly would it be felt on the world's dinner tables? I don't think people know how important Canada is in terms of feeding the world. Canada is a huge contributor to global food supply. We have fed hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people worldwide. When Canada existed, it was a global food powerhouse, exporting billions of dollars of fish, pork, and dairy. But Canada is also a key supplier of one of the world's most important sources of protein. Canada produces a huge amount of lentils and pulses. In the 1960s, some risk-taking farmers took a chance on growing this protein-packed seed in Saskatchewan. It worked, and as global demand soared, a few hundred acres of lentils bloomed into five million. Four decades later, much of the lentils scooped up daily in New Delhi or Karachi come from Saskatchewan. But lentils aren't the only new arrival on the prairies. In recent years, farmers from Saskatchewan and Alberta have been enjoying a new kind of oil boom. One of our most important exports, which is also a Canadian invention, is canola, one of the world's healthiest and most productive oilseed crops. Used in things like biodiesel, cooking oil and livestock feed, canola has become Canada's most valuable crop, pumping as much as $20 billion into the economy. But despite these new arrivals, the prairies still churn out millions of tons of their most famous export. Have you ever heard the expression, Canada is the world's breadbasket? The daily bread is the first choice of everybody almost everywhere on the planet. And we are one of the principal providers of that to all of our fellow human beings. We are regularly in the top four world wheat exporters. Incredibly, every year, Canada exports enough grain to make over 73 billion loaves of bread. 
enough to make 10 loaves for every man, woman, and child on the planet. But you can thank Canada as well for some of your favorite comfort foods. One out of every three French fries consumed around the planet comes from Canada, as does 80% of the planet's maple syrup and almost 90% of all mustard seed. Canadian food has provided more than just nourishment. It's provided inspiration as well. In 1979, when computer engineer Jeff Ruskin needed a name for the home computer he was designing with Steve Jobs, he named it after his favorite snack, the Macintosh. First cultivated in 1811 by John Macintosh on his farm in Dundala, Ontario, in time the Macintosh apple would become Canada's most popular fruit export and the symbol of one of the world's most influential and iconic brands. Following Canada's disappearance, Across the globe, farmers would scramble to make up the shortfall. But the absence of another key Canadian resource is going to make that job next to impossible. There's nothing here. We really could have used some fertilizer. You know. Most plants, other than water and sunlight, need three things. They need nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And the world's biggest supply of potassium is in the form of potash. About 50% of the world's potash reserves are in Canada. With that taken off the map, where are you going to get fertilizer from? Without Canadian potash, crops all over the world fail. This, combined with the absence of Canadian food, pushes the planet to the brink of starvation. We have a hard enough time supporting seven plus billion human beings right now. What would the world do without Canada and its food resources? Famine would be rampant all over the globe. We would see billions, billions with a B, of human beings starved to death. As famine stalks the globe, how would families survive in this hungry new world? You have to go back to being hunters and gatherers. We would be eating whatever we could. That's what people do when they are starving to death. We would go back to a world in which wondering whether you're going to have enough to eat, enough to feed your children, would be a constant preoccupation for the bulk of humanity. The disappearance of Canada's food has pushed the planet to the edge of starvation. But the loss of two other Canadian resources are about to threaten the very air we breathe. Help! Call a doctor! To understand the critical role Canada's resources play in feeding and fueling the planet, we've taken them all away. The loss of Canada's oil, food and water have tipped the planet into crisis. Now the disappearance of another resource will threaten the lives of millions more. Canada's the fifth biggest producer of natural gas in the world. Parts of Western Canada sit atop one of the biggest reservoirs of natural gas on the planet. But getting to it isn't easy. Unlike oil, which can be found relatively close to the surface, we've got to drill down about four kilometers to find our gas. That's roughly the depth of eight CN towers stacked end to end. Losing oil and natural gas is not just about losing gasoline for cars, it's also about electricity generation. Natural gas is one of the most important and fastest growing fuels for generating electricity. Mom? 15 million Americans depend on Canada's gas to keep them warm in the winter. I'm so cold, I turn off the heat. Without the supply of Canadian natural gas, people in the northeastern United States can't heat their homes. Every day, Canada's 39 cross-border pipelines pumped enough gas to heat and light all of New York City, Chicago and Boston combined. Not having natural gas to produce heat is going to affect the vulnerable parts of our population, the elderly. America would scramble to make up for the lost electricity. But just how hard would it be to power the northeast back up? You can't build a dam overnight. You can't build a nuclear power plant overnight. Um, so it's, it's really hard to know where you'd be getting that electricity from. As Americans struggle to heat and light their homes and cook their food, many turn to another source for their salvation. One that a Canadian invented almost 170 years ago. In 1853, Abraham Gessner, a geologist from Cornwallis, Nova Scotia, changed the world when he invented kerosene a 
flammable oil he extracted from a type of coal. Cheap, easy to produce and far safer than an open flame, kerosene finally gave reliable light to millions. Now called the father of the petroleum industry, Abe Gessner ultimately sold the patent to business tycoon John D. Rockefeller. And from high atop the 56th floor of 30 Rockefeller Plaza, John and his son John Jr. used it to help amass one of the largest fortunes in American history. 42 years later, their Art Deco skyscraper would become home to Canadian producer Lorne Michaels' Saturday Night Live, which in turn launched the careers of many Canadian comics, including Martin Short, Mike Myers, and yours truly. So if I haven't said it before, thanks, Abe. But more than a century after his million-dollar idea changed the world, Gessner's invention remains the primary source of energy for much of this planet. If Canada were to disappear, it's safe to assume that millions more would start to burn kerosene to make up for the disappearance of our oil and our natural gas. But as the planet burns through its kerosene supply, what would we turn to next? If the loss of Canadian natural gas is profound enough, then a complete technology shift would be required, and the easiest way to go would be to fall back on coal. If we started burning dirty coal, we would be taking an enormous step back. Are you OK? In terms of the quality of our air. <laughs> take it easy, take it easy. <laughs> Help! Call a doctor! We might literally end up gasping for air. The problem is made worse by the disappearance of another one of Canada's key resources, the boreal forest. So the boreal forest is this amazing patch of land, and it's probably the largest continuous patch of forest on Earth. And it covers about 3 million square kilometers. That's bigger than the size of Mexico. And that represents about 30% of the world's boreal forest, all stored right in Canada. So you can imagine how important this is. Composed of spruce, pine, and poplar, it acts as one of the planet's primary air filters. Our lungs help us remove CO2 from our system. The trees within the boreal forest help remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and that's through the process of photosynthesis. Per tree is actually sucking up twice as much CO2 as a tropical forest. Each year, every acre of these trees absorbs the same amount of CO2 generated by seven car trips across Canada. So if we were to lose the Canadian boreal forest, that would have a consequence for the Earth's climate system. We would have warming if Canada were to disappear. Following the disappearance of Canada's oil, food and natural gas, society teeters on the brink of anarchy. And the collapse of the global economy is about to push it over the edge. After two years, the planet still struggles to adapt to the world without Canada. To make ends meet, many now frequent a new type of shopping center, where some of the most valued goods are the ones that Canada used to produce in abundance. Canada is a huge player for mining, not just in terms of the expertise that it has in that sector, but in terms of the actual metals that are mined. In fact, it's a mining superpower. Canadian-owned mines operate in 107 different countries. And it's estimated that roughly 75% of all global mining corporations have headquarters in Canada. The skill set, the talent, the expertise that drives these companies is rooted in Canada. In terms of geologists, geophysics, all of the people that you need to actually explore for natural resources, everything is linked to Canadian expertise. Closer to home, Canada's own mines pump out over 60 different metals and minerals. It's a major producer of gold, copper, zinc, nickel, diamonds, and iron ore. We are the bankers of the world. The natural vaults of Canadian mines are where so much of the wealth of this planet has been concentrated. Canada is also one of the world's largest producers of uranium. Almost 8,000 tons of it a year are pulled from the MacArthur River mine in northern Saskatchewan, the largest uranium mine on the planet. Used by nuclear reactors all over the world to create clean electricity, incredibly just one 20-gram pellet of uranium can produce as much electricity 
as 400 kilograms of coal or 410 liters of oil. But Canada's uranium does more than just make power. It's made history as well. In 1930, Gilbert Labine, a high school dropout from Pembroke, Ontario, pushed Canada and the world into the atomic age when he discovered uranium in the Northwest Territories. His find changed the world forever when it was used to power the two atomic bombs that ended World War II. But now all that's gone. The loss of these precious metals was first felt on global stock markets. Diamond prices, gold prices, nickel prices, all of those would instantly skyrocket. Those metals would be worth even more. And we would stop using them up in industry. We would save them as a currency. As companies and countries began to hoard precious metals, global manufacturing took a massive hit. There's an old saying in mining, which is basically that if something isn't grown on a tree, it's coming out of the ground. To build buildings, you need steel, you need concrete, all that's coming from mining. To build an iPhone or to build a computer, you need rare earth metals, you have the battery, which is going to be a lithium ion battery. So all technology uh, it basically runs off of mining. In fact, experts believe that every North American child born today will need over 500 pounds of zinc and 1,000 pounds of lead and copper just to build the electronics they'll use over their lifetime. And it's easy to see why. 62 different types of metals are used in a typical smartphone alone, and many are mined in Canada. Gold and silver for circuits, aluminum for the case and glass, potassium and indium for the touchscreen, cobalt for the rechargeable battery, the loss of our precious metals would cripple high-tech production, forcing the world to find new sources. But how easy would that be? To make up for that production doesn't happen overnight. Uh, especially metals, it takes decades to discover a mine. It takes probably four or five years to build a mine. It takes millions of dollars. So without Canon in the picture, people aren't going to have the raw materials to build anything. This would be a change that would affect people on a daily basis. They would suddenly see the price of, say, an electronic shoot up because suddenly minerals from Canada weren't available. When the price increases, it's going to create a lot of chaos because a lot of people aren't going to be able to afford it. A black market would undoubtedly crop up. There'd be a black market for cellular phones, for home computers. These things, because of the metals and precious minerals that go into their manufacture, would be so dearly expensive and valuable that they would be stolen and traded on the black market. Let's take a look, man. The problem with a black market is that you don't know what you're getting. And there's a lot of crime and, and danger associated with obtaining those goods. I'll give you $200 for it. No way. 300 bucks. All right. $300. All right, 300 then. OK, OK. In the world without Canada, hard currency is king. But in a black market, what you see isn't always what you get. This doesn't look right at all, man. Turbo fast when I'm here. Try to rip you up. I didn't go. Hey. Oh, Canada's disappearance has caused a spike in counterfeit American currency. Ironically, it's a Canadian invention that makes this so hard to do. While working at McGill University in the 1850s, Canadian scientist Thomas Sterry Hunt developed a green ink for currencies that couldn't be reproduced by photography. It was quickly put to use by the U.S. Treasury, and a nickname that endures to this day was born, the Greenback. The iconic American bill isn't Canada's only contribution to the world's wallets, though. Since its creation in 1908, the Royal Canadian Mint has pounded out millions of Mexican pesos, Chinese yuan, Brazilian centavos, British shillings and Icelandic kroner. All told, it struck 52 billion coins for 75 countries. That's enough to create an 83,000 kilometer tall coin roll, one that would stretch almost a quarter of the way to the moon. But counterfeit bills and the lack of change aren't the only problems facing the economy today in a world without Canada. As faith in money plunged, it's possible people would be driven to get hold of Canada's most valuable resource. Gold is huge in Canada. It's a top producer of gold. Each year, more than $5 billion worth of gold is pulled from Canadian mines. 
That's enough to make a solid gold ring for every single one of Canada's 37 million inhabitants. As economies melt down across the globe, gold becomes even more valuable. Gold is traditionally the place where people invest when there's uncertainty in the markets. Even if the rest of the world goes into crisis, that gold will hold its value. In ancient Rome, one ounce of gold was enough to buy a really nice toga. You fast forward to today, and one ounce of gold is worth about $1,200. That's about enough to buy a really nice suit, so it's held its value. But in a world without Canadian precious metals, those precious metals that are available would become something that the little guy would go after. Across the state, police are struggling to deal with what they are now calling epidemic armed robberies. Given its incredible value, people will now go to almost any lengths to get it. We go back to a world where the guy who has the gun is the guy who basically calls literally the shots. It would be a very scary place to live. We would not realize how much we had lost until it was gone, and then we would be terrified. Canada's disappearance has forced many into lives of desperation and crime. But things are about to get even worse as the planet itself responds to the world without Canada. without Canada is now 30 years old. Some of the areas ravaged by tsunamis, famine, and the collapse of the global economy have finally been rebuilt. People in the northern portions of North America would suddenly find themselves at the northern frontier of a new sea. For the kids who grew up in the world without Canada, this strange reality is the only one they've ever known. There's going to be all sorts of really interesting new fisheries along the north coast of the United States if there were no Canada. It could quite possibly be a very rich fishing ground. But this prosperity comes at a price. Not having a huge landmass with mountains and forests is going to make for insane weather changes. All along America's northern coast, superstorms are now the new normal. Landfall this morning near Port Ambrose, North Dakota, making it the third hurricane to strike already this summer. But Canada's absence has turned up the heat in other ways as well. Albedo refers to the measure of how reflective a surface is. And you can imagine on a very hot day, if you went out in a black t-shirt, you would feel the sunlight warming your skin uh, relative to if you went outside in a white t-shirt. So that happens on a large scale in our ecosystems. Any lighter colored surfaces, snow and ice, has a very high albedo. That means it's reflecting quite a lot of the sun's energy back to the atmosphere, and that prevents warming of the Earth's surface. Canada is a snow-covered region for most of the year, and if Canada were to suddenly disappear and be placed by ocean, this would be quite a dramatic shift in albedo. Ocean water is very dark. It absorbs a lot of energy from the sun. And so that actually acts to heat up the planet. While the spike in heat generates monster storms off America's northern coast, it means something very different for the rest of the country. The central part of the United States will look a lot like the outback of Australia. The desert is going to expand, and most of the center part of the country probably would not be suitable for growing food at all or for people living. Drought and searing heat will be the norm. Heat waves kill people, right? They kill more people than any other weather-related phenomena. And so when we talk about creating deserts, for instance, in the central parts of the United States, we're talking about either moving people or having the rate at which people die due to heat stress increasing tremendously. Humans aren't the only ones feeling the heat in the world without Canada. Any 
large ranging animal, any large migratory patterns simply would not be supported anymore if Canada were simply to disappear. When it disappeared, so did almost 75% of the world's polar bears. Most of the woodland caribou, Canadian lynx, wolverines, and most of North America's grizzlies. Out to sea, it's just as bad. Two-thirds of the world's beluga whales and narwhals starved after their summer feeding grounds vanished. And more species were doomed by the disappearance of another key habitat. The coastline of Arctic Canada is fascinating. This is an area where Canada is truly unique. When it existed, Canada had more coastline than any other country. Of the 350,000 kilometers of total oceanfront property on the planet, Canada claimed over 200,000 kilometers of it. To cover it all on foot, you'd need to walk 12 hours a day for nine years. When it disappeared, so did millions of birds. We absolutely drive global bird populations. We're talking billions of birds, and they rely on the expanse of habitat that Canada has to offer. But the world would lose more than just habitat if Canada vanished. It would lose the birthplace of some of the environment's most passionate defenders. Founded by St. Boniface, Manitoba native Robert Hunter and a handful of like-minded activists, Greenpeace was formed in Vancouver in 1971 to protest American nuclear testing in Alaska. It now operates in over 50 countries and has become one of the planet's most high-profile protectors of the oceans and forests and high Arctic. There's another Canadian that really aligns what he believes in with what he does. David Suzuki is a fantastic model for sharing his vision of what the environment could be on a global level. A third generation Japanese Canadian, Suzuki was born in Vancouver in 1936. While working as a genetics professor at the University of British Columbia, he began to appear on television and radio. And now, almost 50 years later, Suzuki remains one of the planet's most passionate and articulate defenders of the environment. He's a fantastic voice for showing what we can do, how we can do it, and for inspiring future generations. In the short term, Canada's disappearance turned up the heat in the north. But what impact might the loss of one of the world's biggest land masses have on long-term climate as we push far into the future? What would the world without Canada look like? When Canada first disappeared, the loss of millions of acres of carbon storing trees led to a massive spike in global CO2 levels. Carbon dioxide essentially works as kind of a heat wrap. As CO2 levels in the atmosphere rose, so did the temperatures. But as the oceans expanded to make up for the loss of Canada, there was now much more water to absorb the excess CO2. Over time, they sucked up huge amounts of carbon and the planet began to cool. Once we actually get the planet cold enough to start producing sea ice and snow again, we get a snowball effect. We would ultimately be plummeted into another ice age. It would be devastating. The last ice age took humanity to the brink of extinction, plunging the global population to an estimated 10,000 people. But how would modern humans adapt to such a harsh environment? How long could we last in a world of endless winter? Without Canada around to broker the peace, the fate of the entire planet is about to be jeopardized. The world without Canada concludes tomorrow with the loss of our history on history. The world without Canada is a bleak and unforgiving place. But this, of course, is just an alternate reality. The consequences of an improbable thought experiment. But if we return everything to its rightful place and bring Canada back from oblivion, how does the planet's path change? And what does the future hold for Canada? Canada's colossal oil reserves will keep the world moving for ages to come. We are so necessary. We are the engine of the planet. After Venezuela and Saudi Arabia, we have the third largest amount of oil still in the ground. And our vast amounts of natural gas will supply millions of North Americans with heat well into the 22nd century. 
Natural gas is outside of some renewables. It's the fastest growing power source in the world for electricity. It's cleaner than coal and oil and other traditional fossil fuels. Society is moving forward on a progressive stance on using renewable resources, using renewable power, and that will continue to march on. But Canada will do more than just keep the lights on. People all over the world enjoy Canadian foodstuffs. The bread, the potatoes from Prince Edward Island, the grains feed the world. We should be enormously proud and excited. And as the world's population continues to explode, Canada will play an even bigger role in feeding the hungry. Canada is poised, both as an exporter and as a technology developer, to play a global leadership role in meeting the future food needs of the global population. I hope you like it. And Canada will provide the world with other types of gifts as well. Oh, it's... <laughs> that was a reaction I was hoping. <laughs> Canadians will also continue to lead the world in the discovery of precious metals and minerals. We have so much land area, and so little of it has been thoroughly prospected and explored. It's possible we have all kinds of resources we don't even know about yet. But there's one thing we know we've got tons of. Of the three billion ounces of mineable gold still in the earth, Canada has the second biggest share. Experts believe we've got about 430 million ounces, valued at roughly $515 billion. That's enough to buy every single house in Edmonton, Calgary, and Winnipeg. And as the planet faces unprecedented threats to its climate, Canadians will continue to fight for the environment. We are ambassadors of an Arctic country. We are warming at a rate that's faster than any other country on Earth. We have a real opportunity to teach the rest of the world about the kinds of climate changes that are occurring here within our own borders, and I think that's our responsibility to do. More and more Canadians are going to take the lead on a world stage, not only by example, but in action. We have these vast stretches of wilderness that are some of the last remaining pieces of wilderness on the planet. And I think it's a real gift that we have to protect. Can you open yours? Yeah, I guess you can open yours. There you go. Canada is a place that people turn to when they want to think about a future that works. Anyone living in Canada today should not go through a single day where they don't reflect on the fact that they are living in one of the most peaceful, healthiest, and wealthiest places in the world. We care about the world. No matter what the circumstances, we roll up our sleeves and we pitch in. If that means helping other countries on the ground, if that means planting more where we are, if that means sharing our surpluses, we'll do it. For 150 years, Canada has played a vital role in an ever-changing planet. And as we move towards an uncertain future, one thing is clear. Now more than ever, the world needs Canada. A world with Canada is a world to celebrate. It's a world where everyone is welcome at the door. It's a world that wants to be a better place and wants to start here. I could not be more proud and feel lucky about being a Canadian. Merci Canada. Bonne fête.